USS Enterprise stood alone. She was the only aircraft carrier the US Navy had in the Pacific Theater. Her sisters had fallen. Her surviving comrades were either cobbling together a defense around Guadalcanal, or protecting the convoys crossing the Atlantic, keeping their allies and expeditionary forces alive, while they slowly rolled the Germans back across North Africa. In fact, even as her dearest friend USS Vestal and her long-suffering crew of mechanics and CBs were getting to work repairing her, a large amphibious operation began in what was then called French West Africa, codenamed Operation Torch with the goal of finally encircling and destroying Rommel's deadly Africa Corps, which had been making life exceedingly difficult for the better part of two years. However, of even greater concern was the advance of the Japanese. The Battle of Santa Cruz had been extremely costly for both sides, but it was clear that the Americans had come off far worse. Losing Hornet was a devastating blow, both materially and psychologically, to everyone concerned. But thankfully... The crew and most of her aviators had survived, and many of whom were even now aboard Enterprise regrouping. And as a result of being the only carrier still in harm's way against the advancing Japanese, the crew aboard Grey Ghost hung a sign in the hangar bay. In bold letters it proudly read, Enterprise vs. Japan. Overall though, the situation was not looking good. Uncle Sam's misguided children had managed to hold off against the advancing Japanese army and navy landing forces, and they had done pretty well up to this point. But until new crayon crusaders arrived from Paris Island, manpower was going to be limited, while the lion's share of supplies were heading to support the aforementioned Operation Torch. Meanwhile, the Tokyo Express was bringing in reinforcements to the Japanese garrison on the island, who were now reorganizing for yet another offensive to take Henderson Field. Their previous assault had been a bloody failure, being brutally repulsed by Chesty and his men, resulting in the loss of half of their force. But with the advantage of having lots of forward bases nearby, a squadron of fast destroyers able to run down the slot in one night, as well as a military tradition reminiscent of a marketing strategy for overpriced miniatures, What is your duty to serve the Emperor's will? What is the Emperor's will? That we fight and die. What is death? It is our duty. Manpower wasn't much of a problem. What was a problem was firepower. Due to the fact that the Cactus Air Force, in typical Marine Corps fashion, violently assaulted anything with a red circle on it, this unfortunately included Royal Australian Air Force aircraft on more than one occasion, hence why we changed our roundel to the one without a dot in it. Honestly, when taken as a whole, actually, the Marines kind of remind me of this TV show when I was a kid. It was called The Big Knights. The height of two men, the weight of four, the strength of sixteen. Sir Boris, finest swordsman in the world, and his brother, Sir Morris. Not the finest swordsman in the world, but the most enthusiastic. Yep, a small cadre of professionals leading a group of mentally challenged but highly enthusiastic killing machines. They are a menace to civilization, but they are our menace, and I ask you, where would we be without them? Anyway, where was I? Ah yeah, marine aviators. The marine aviators in question kept blasting ships that sailed down the slot during the daylight hours, and the Japanese had finally started to learn that fighting marines head-on is not an intelligent move, and that they would fight just as hard as their most zealous of troops. Worse still, they had problems of their own. While the Americans had been losing ships they couldn't afford, at least in the short term, and suffering heavy casualties on land and in the air, dislodging the Americans from their positions on Guadalcanal would take more than the resources they had on hand. Without heavy artillery, air support, and a lot of armor, their chances of winning this fight were practically zero. The Army High Command, therefore, petitioned Yamamoto to get a task force together to clear the way for a convoy. This convoy was to be filled to the brim with the heaviest equipment they could muster in the hope that if they could get their gear onto the island along with some ammo, the Tokyo Express could then get the men there to use it. It would take the bulk of their available surface force and all of the air power available in the region, primarily coming from their bases on Rabaul, with a smaller contingent from the aircraft carrier Junyo, which was hanging around, but, in keeping with Japanese doctrine of decisive battle, the idea was to focus 
all of their combat power in a single hammer blow. If this succeeded in defeating the Allied naval presence in the region, they could then use their warships to obliterate Henderson Field and gain air supremacy, paving the way for a massed assault to retake Walled Canal. Yamamoto readily approved of the plan. Given the loss of Carrier Division 5's air wings as well as the destruction of his light carrier forces, he had to operate within the range of his land bases anyway. And removing the Americans from Guadalcanal would seriously improve their position in the region, even if it meant detailing assets to support the army, something which all Japanese naval officers despised doing. There was also the other factor though to consider, the factor which every nation that fights the United States has to contend with. They were on a time limit. The Americans have enough logistical and material capacity to swamp Japan. In fact, they were already beginning to do so. After the reversal at Midway and the loss of Guadalcanal, they needed to score some victories and secure a perimeter while keeping their forces alive. They had gotten off to a good start as they had defeated the Americans at the Battle of Santa Cruz. What they needed to do now was capitalize on that success and regain the initiative. And so, Admiral Yamamoto put his plan into motion to do exactly that. As November 1942 began, the 7,000 men of the 38th Infantry Division boarded their transports as the heavy equipment was loaded into the cargo holds. Artillery, tanks, trucks, heavy mortars, and all the food and fuel they would ever need. 11 fully loaded heavy tonnage cargo vessels, packed to the mast, as Imperial Japan was not exactly known for the consideration of its soldiers' well-being. So, yeah, it was standing room only on this bitch. There were no do-overs at this point, no take-backs. They would either prevail or perish. And Admiral Yamamoto knew as he pondered his shogi board, failure here would doom any hope of going on the offensive in the future. And not only that, without a position of strength, they wouldn't have any hope of negotiating a peace. And in a war against the United States, that only ever has one ending. A funeral pyre for his empire. So everything he could provide to this offensive, he would. The Solomon's Island Channel was too shallow for the flagship. You thought I was going to do it, didn't you? <laughs> gotcha. Don't worry, though. She'll come back for her last hurrah in part four. So anyway, <laughs> without Yamato and Masashi, it would be the Congo class that were going to lead the charge, and they were going to be under command of Admiral Hirioke Abe. The flagship of the task force would be the battleship Hiei, flanked by her sister ship, the battleship Kirishima. They would be joined by the cruiser Nagara and a destroyer flotilla of 11 ships. And leading that particular flotilla was the Yukikaze, the luckiest ship in the Japanese Navy. With the destruction of Hornet and most of the battleships being still at the bottom of Pearl Harbor, the odds were in their favor. Or so it appeared. But there was one issue with this plan. The same issue there always is with Japanese plans. A secret plan only works if it's, well, a secret. And thanks to the Intel basement dwellers on Oahu, in the hypo room, this plan was not a secret. Admiral Chester Nimitz and his subordinates were viewing the intelligence reports while gazing with trepidation at their maps. Admiral Halsey, now back in action, was in his normal mood of wanting to sail directly to truck with his entire surface force in order for him to challenge Yamamoto to a one-on-one -on -one fist fight on the docks. But uh, given the situation and the aforementioned super battleships lurking in open waters nearby, such a course would uh, not be advisable. Even so, with the intelligence that the Japanese were getting ready to mount a serious effort once again to try and take Guadalcanal for one last time, it was decided that if the enemy wanted to force a decisive battle, the Solomons were the place to do it. After all, their carriers were under refit and resupply, while the super battleships can't engage here. With the Cactus Air Force to offer air cover during the day, and the new US battleships equipped with radar sets to handle night fighting, the equation was far more balanced than their previous surface engagements. In any case, Chesty's boys needed reinforcing, and so from every source they could draw, more marines were rounded up, contained, desexed, and dog-tagged for our safety. And even more amazingly, the army were following on behind with their heavier gear, as well as their own air group. As with Midway before, it was determined that should the Japanese attempt to take the real estate they paid so much for, 
it would cost them an incredible amount of interest. And the worst part for the Japanese is that all of this was done in advance of their departure. Once again, the Americans had set a trap, and they were ready to meet their foe on even terms. But I don't think either side had any idea just how badly this was going to go for everybody involved. As the newly arrived Devil Dogs dug in alongside their GI brethren, for as we all know, apes together are strong, the Japanese task force had put to sea. The battleships had been issued with special incendiary fragmentation shells. Similar to how modern cluster munitions are designed, their purpose was to critically damage aircraft and light vehicles while igniting munitions and fuel storage, perfect for bombarding an airfield. The Japanese, still convinced that all was going to plan, or all according to Kaikaku, for those of you who are indulgent in weeb memes, proceeded down the Solomon's Island Channel. However, after today, that Solomon Island's channel would earn a different name. Iron Bottom Sound. You know, I would say spoiler alert, but given the track record of battles in these specific waters, you have all probably worked out how this is going to go. But believe me, calling what's coming up a mere shit show would be like me calling the American Civil War a slight disagreement over domestic policy. This is more of a septic tank through a steam turbine scenario. As the 12th of November was coming to an end with a glorious Pacific sunset, an American recon aircraft spotted the Japanese task force, radioing its position, which was immediately reported to the American task force commander, one Admiral Daniel Callahan. He immediately ordered his force on an intercept course, Sailing in column past Henderson Field, his force consisted of two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and eight destroyers. His flagship was the San Francisco, while the other cruisers in the formation were Portland, Helena, Juno, and Atlanta. But despite appearances, those cruisers? They aren't the true heavy hitters. For with him, he had one ship. One beautiful, magnificent ship who we shall meet at the most opportune moment. Though leading the destroyers was none other than a lead ship in class, USS Fletcher. Given the balance of forces, as well as the fact they had the speed advantage and prior knowledge of the Japanese position and radar, it would seem that the Americans were in place for a sneaky nighttime ambush. But alas, Grand Admiral Murphy of the JAG office was well and truly present. What can go wrong, will go wrong. And tonight, this guy was head of the prosecution. Admiral Callahan, despite having all of the aces up his sleeve, did not brief his senior officers of a plan, nor did he establish a concrete standard operating procedure for their rules of engagement, which meant that he would have to coordinate the operation completely on the fly via micromanagement, or simply rely on the captains of each ship to take a leaf out of their aviation colleagues' book and wing it. And they were to do all of this in the middle of the night. But wait, he's not done. The Americans, with the newer cruisers and destroyers in the formation to support the older ships, should have constant range and bearing updates to plan around. As I mentioned, they have radar. Problem was, for whatever reason, Callahan had the radar-equipped vessels at the back of the formation instead of the front. Again, in the middle of the night. I don't know what his plan was, but as the previous bit indicates, he probably didn't have one. Thankfully, American naval radar is actually outstanding and it has great range, so it would still give them an edge. It's just that they've lost 20 minutes of situational awareness they'd otherwise have. So yeah, the American camp looks pretty shoddy and all around terrible from this perspective, and it was really bad on this particular evening. But they weren't the only ones having problems. Admiral Abe was, in typical Japanese Navy fashion, operating under a far more complex battle plan in confined quarters at midnight with a timetable to keep. Now it must be said here again, the Japanese surface fleet until the latter stages of the war were some of the finest sailors of their day. Their training and discipline was matched only by their ferocity, 
It's why when the US Navy got into a gun range, nine times out of ten it was the Japanese who prevailed. It's ironic that, considering that the Japanese were in fact the ones to pioneer carrier aviation to what we know it as today, but alas, in such a conservative traditionalist society, the fleet faction won out. But as we know, that traditionalism was no match for the changing of the times. The Allies as a whole were modernising, using technology to augment their forces as part of a steel not flesh policy, which is why Allied casualties were a lot lower than all the other major combatants like the Japanese, the Soviets and the Germans. While the Japanese primarily focused on training and proven methods. This is a really fine balancing act, but when you match that technical superiority with the raw industrial might of the United States, you create something that's nigh on unstoppable. The Japanese vessels did not have much radar to speak of, if any at all. They relied completely on night sights, spotlights and basic communication, as well as extensive nighttime training drills for night battles that the Japanese crews were well proficient in. But it doesn't change the fact that they were attempting to conduct a complex night operation under near radio silence in confined waters. And when it couldn't get any worse, they hit a rain squall. The Japanese split up into multiple little groups, thereby breaking that formation entirely. They don't have a formation anymore. This was a terrible situation. And then, say it with me now ladies and gentlemen, it got worse. Through the darkness as they broke out of the rain squall, the lookouts on Hiei noticed shadows in the distance, contrasted against the dark indigo horizon. Meanwhile, on the USS San Francisco, Admiral Callahan had been getting panicked reports from his radar operators about Japanese ships that had popped up out of nowhere. Due to the myriad of blunders on both sides, the two groups were, in naval terms at least, right on top of one another. Admiral Callahan didn't believe the radar and wanted to clarify the range. They couldn't possibly be this close. He was originally planning to cross the T of the Japanese formation, but there were not one, but several groups of Japanese ships moving independently. Abe, meanwhile, had a different problem. He had no issue engaging the Americans. In fact, this was a great opportunity. Problem was, his battleships were configured for shore bombardment with the special cluster munitions, not armor piercing and high explosive for gunfighting enemy ships. If his rounds were to be fully effective, he'd have to pull the heavies back to reload, which would put the Nagara and her destroyers in a really tough situation. After giving it some thought, he decided to do what almost all Japanese commanders do. When in doubt, attack, otherwise known as default aggressive. The Japanese turned into the Americans and advanced. Seeing this, Callahan ordered his ships to do complex maneuvers to match the Japanese ships, but due to not having briefed his commanders the night before on what their roles or even their designations were, no one had a clear idea what was happening and so the US formation broke up just as the Japanese formation had done, with the American ships moving to meet the Japanese ships in their own little groups. All the while, on both sides, the captains of these vessels were frantically sending signals to their respective commanders asking, please, for the love of God, let us shoot. And both sides gave orders to hold fire. This continued until both formations were now intermingled. You heard me correctly. The lead US vessels had to evade in order to prevent collision with the Japanese ships. The distances to targets were now 3,000 yards. What we had was a Mexican standoff while in the middle of the Solomon Islands at 1 a.m. on November 13th, 1942. It was then that Abe made his move. He had closed the range in order to envelop the American formation while simultaneously ensuring that his main guns, armed with the special frag ammunition, had the best chance of doing critical damage. Hiei spotlights flashed on, illuminating USS Atlanta at point-blank range. Oh, shit. Ute! Shells began flying from the Japanese ships at the Americans. This initial volley was followed by a barrage of torpedoes. Atlanta's superstructure was immolated, while a torpedo shattered her engineering section. She came to a dead stop, adrift and burning unable to retaliate against the swarm of enemy ships around her. She would sink later that day. <laughs>
Meanwhile, the Americans instinctively returned fire at the nearby Japanese ships. The destroyer Akatsuki, which was the lead vessel that illuminated Atlanta, was the nearest target, and it was currently lit up like a Christmas tree. What amounted to the entire American cruiser flotilla and the lead destroyers fired on her all at once. Akatsuki took a hit in her magazine and exploded in a ball of flame, which lit up the surrounding area. Marines on Guadalcanal saw the fight in progress. Robert Leckie was among them. His recount is shown briefly in the TV series The Pacific. That huge explosion in this scene is most likely the Akatsuki. She was quickly followed in this fate by the US destroyer Cushing, who had been the lead ship and was now in the middle of the entire Japanese formation. She got blasted by all the Japanese ships in range. Coming to a dead stop, completely crippled, she kept firing her guns until her main power failed. She too sank later that day. All the while this was happening, Admiral Callahan kept giving confusing orders. He ordered odd ships to fire starboard, and even ships to fire port. The only problem is he hadn't briefed anybody on which ship was which, and who they were supposed to be shooting at. He then gave course orders, which no one could follow because no one had any idea where they were anymore. Their formation had basically ceased to exist. And thus, everyone just swirled around in a melee, trying to work out what to do while shooting everything they had at whatever target they could find. This was the kind of fight the Japanese had trained their whole careers for, and they soon started to gain the upper hand. The American sailors weren't their equal here, and what's worse, they would very soon be within katana range. It was then that the worst case scenario appeared. Out of the darkness, a huge bank of searchlights illuminating targets for her massive guns, came the flagship Hiei. Abe was tearing towards USS San Francisco, which he had identified as the biggest ship and obviously the command ship, given where it was in what was left of the American formation. It was then, something incredible happened. A battle cry, yelled from the darkness. A more ferocious call to arms than any samurai could muster. Alright chumps, let's do this! USS Laffy! The destroyer USS Laffy closed in between the cruisers and Hiei, getting within, and I shit you not, 20 feet of the Japanese battleship. So close that not even her secondary guns could track the destroyer. Laffy unleashed everything she had. The barrels on her AA guns and her 5 inches nearly melted, while men on the decks were firing with machine guns and rifles. It wouldn't surprise me if they even had bayonets on. Hiei's superstructure was obliterated. Admiral Abe was wounded as his chief of staff was instantly killed by shrapnel from Laffy's assault. But as with the meme that inspired the opening of this paragraph, Laffy's colleagues, seeing her dive into the maelstrom without fear, decided, screw it, we'll all go in too. The American destroyers went full send and closed in on Hiei, firing everything, while the cruiser squadron fired on her as well over the heads of their comrades. Hiei's crew though, realizing that there was nothing to be done about the destroyers as they were inside minimum torpedo range, decided to kill the American flagship. While all this was going on, Hiei pummeled San Francisco, killing Admiral Callahan, while other Japanese ships tried to cover their own flagship blowing Laffy to pieces. However, Laffy has a spirit that never dies, and we shall see her again. In the chaotic firefight that followed, San Francisco hit Hiei's engineering spaces, flooding them, while she herself was dismantled shell by shell. Then long lances started flying, crippling or outright obliterating American ships. They tried to fight back, sinking the destroyers Amatsukaze and Yudachi while damaging almost all the other vessels. But they were simply outmatched. Kitashima joined the fray, crippling two of the destroyers, while Nagara and the other destroyers wrapped back around. And it was at this moment, this very moment for the first time that night, that both sides had a moment to breathe. The Americans were down to USS Fletcher and USS Helena, while well, the Japanese actually had most of their force still able to fight. But Abe, now receiving medical attention, was faced with a dilemma. 
Due to the surface action, he had expended a lot of his ammunition, as well as a lot of time. He could push on to Henderson Field, but that would mean shelling the field with only one battleship instead of two, as he, a his flagship, was now dead in the water. Not to mention that should preparations not be made immediately to launch recovery operations, it would be broad daylight before he could get his forces reorganized. And then there is the convoy coming down the slot behind him. If the surface force he just destroyed is dead, the airmen from Rabaul and Junyo should be able to cover them as Otago and Takao can bring the convoy in. If he regroups with them along with Kirishima, he should be able to assert total surface dominance in the area. Admiral Abe, despite only having two American ships in his way that he could easily sink, decided that he was not equipped to take out Henderson Field, and thus he ordered his force to withdraw. Once again, with victory so nearly in their grasp, a Japanese surface commander pulled back. They stand to learn something from their aviators. Rule 2 of the Dictabolkus clearly states, once an attack is begun, you must see it through to the end. But then again, the man had just taken a bullet to the shoulder in the middle of a horrific close-in firefight, which cost him several ships and all of his ammo. Plus, he had absolutely no idea if the Americans had more ships, because, you know, no radar. So I tend to cut this man a bit of slack, unlike a certain other admiral. As the sun rose, the aftermath could clearly be seen with multiple burning hulks littering Iron Bottom Sound. Portland was still listing and burning. However, upon sighting remaining Japanese destroyers, she fired what guns were still operable, while evacuations took place on both sides. Hiei, meanwhile, was under tow to safety. Yamamoto had ordered the convoy to regroup with the surviving vessels from the previous night, which meant they had to delay their run down the slot in preparation for making a night landing. However, they had failed to hit Henderson Field, their primary objective. Damage control teams aboard Hiei were struggling to restore power. Admiral Abe requested air support to cover the convoy from the Cactus Air Force, who would almost certainly now be on their way. Junyo, the carrier who was at sea 200 kilometers north of the islands, scrambled her entire fighter force, as did Rabaul. An entire wing of Zeros took station above the crippled battleship as she limped back to Truck Lagoon. But they wouldn't be enough, because the Marines were not the only ones hunting them. Enterprise ready? Engage! Let's go. The Grim Reapers descended on the Zeros. They had expected attacks from the Cactus Air Force, and they had weathered an attack from B-17s earlier in the day. What they hadn't reckoned on was USS Enterprise. The dogfight was relatively even, with casualties on both sides, but given the loss of Carrier Division 5, between VF-10 and the Cactus Aviators, the Japanese pilots were outnumbered and steadily pushed back leaving the way open for attack pilots to do their work. Shiny brand new TBF Avengers rolled in on the target. Hiei was crippled and unable to maneuver. Even so, she desperately tried, managing to evade all but one torpedo, which slammed into the main torpedo blister. The dive bombers likewise struggled to hit their target, dodging the second wave of Junyo Zeros while diving in. But three 500-pound bombs from Enterprise's SBDs managed to flood Hiei's steering gear before they beat a hasty retreat. But the sturdy Congo class was still afloat, and as the dust settled from this opening salvo, the Japanese frantically worked to keep their ship alive, pumping the steering section and getting Hiei properly underway again. Admiral Abe, given the circumstances, ordered Captain Nishida to beach the battleship, but Nishida told him to go fornicate himself with his ceremonial sword and that he was going to save his ship. He still had some air cover, though limited, and his engineering teams were getting the ship back to running condition. 
All they needed to do was to make it to the protective envelope of the air cover between Rabaul and Truck, while being out of range of the Cactus Air Force. It wasn't an impossible task. At least it wouldn't have been, if not for the Grey Ghost. As the Japanese damage control teams finally got the steering repaired and the engines running, the lookouts began screaming the alarm. Under the depleted fighter screen, on the deck, at full power, with absolutely no fear, Enterprise's torpedo pilots thundered towards Hiei. Six TBF Avengers in attack formation, lining up their shot. Escape was impossible. All the Japanese sailors could do was watch in horror as the long silvery wakes of torpedoes tracked towards them. The Zeros dove in at the last moment on the attackers, but it was far too late. Two torpedoes slammed into Hiei's side. She was listing and therefore these didn't hit the armor belt, but the waterline. One in the aft quarter and the other one once again into the stern, wrecking the steering compartment completely. After all of their hard work to save it, the crew's efforts were undone in a second. But the ordeal wasn't over. With the Zeros chasing the retreating torpedo planes, they weren't able to respond to the follow-up attack from Enterprise's Dauntless pilots, and they did what they did best. Bombing and strafing here, emptying their guns into the superstructure and the bridge. Captain Nishida, even with bullets whizzing around him, remained at his post, refusing to take cover. He had fought valiantly. He had served as the Admiral's flag officer and ship commander. He had faced his enemy in mortal combat to the death. He would not run from this. But Admiral Abe had strict orders from Yamamoto. Hiei was to be abandoned but not scuttled. She was to serve as a distraction to the American aviators in order to draw fire from the approaching convoy. The crew was to be evacuated to the destroyer screen. However, Abe knew that Nishida wouldn't do it willingly, so he did the only thing an officer in the Imperial Navy would have to answer to. Admiral Abe put the order to abandon ship in writing and sent it over in a cutter with his adjutant carrying it. Nishida, upon receiving it, was seen to be stoic but despondent. This was his ship! But orders from the Yamamoto carry the Emperor's will. And he was a Japanese officer sworn to follow those until death. He gave the order to abandon ship. Battleship Hiei would sink, taking 188 men of her crew to the bottom of Iron Bottom Sound. Captain Masao Nishida survived, but he took a staff job, bitter at the loss of his ship. And sadly for the Japanese, that sacrifice was in vain. Realizing that Hiei was a doomed ship given how much damage they had done, Enterprise and her marine colleagues had received reports of the transport convoy now approaching. Every single aircraft and every ounce of ordnance they could muster was brought online. Both NT and Henderson Field launched their entire force. Light was fading fast and they had spent so much effort on Hiei they couldn't let a second go to waste. What followed was a massacre. Rabaul was at the top end of the Solomon's Island chain, while Junyo was still about 150 kilometers north of the islands. Their air groups had put up a good account of themselves earlier in the day. They were, after all, still the finest fighter pilots in the world at the time. But as with their adversaries in the RAF, the problem with being one of the chosen few is that you keep getting fewer. And unlike the rest of the combatants in World War II, the Japanese pilot training programs were kept at their pre-war standards until things got properly desperate and it was far too late. And even then, they didn't have either the aircraft or fuel reserves to properly maintain what high training standard regimens they did have. As a result, replacements did not keep up with their losses. And those that did make it still had the same attritional conditions as their more experienced senpais. The fact was, they just didn't have enough planes or pilots. And they were operating at a much higher range than the Americans. For the rest of the 13th of November and throughout the 14th, Enterprise and the Cactus Air Force flew sortie after sortie against the incoming convoy, and it was bordering on cold-blooded murder. 
The Grim Reapers and the Marines overwhelmed the Zeros, while SPDs and Avengers sent enough ordnance downrange that if you lined it up, you could probably walk to the convoy from their base at Henderson Field. Six of the transports were sunk, while one more was heavily crippled, leaving only four of the transports to continue on. Most of the tanks, artillery, ammo, and most crucially of all, food for the forces in Guadalcanal were consigned to the depths of Iron Bottom Sound. Even so, the remaining men and equipment had to get through to keep the campaign alive. It was hoped that maybe they could keep the garrison going long enough to get another convoy through later in December. But as night fell on the 14th of November 1942, those dreams would be dashed. As the Japanese forces approached Guadalcanal to land their troops, an American surface squadron had arrived to reinforce the survivors of the previous night's engagement. The battle to come seemed to start exactly as the first one had. The Japanese, with a complex formation of multiple ships moving ahead of the convoy, managed to close in on the Americans, despite their superior radar. In the opening stages of the battle, they demolished the destroyer screen, sinking the four ships in it outright. However, unfortunately for them, there is a reason why they call it a screen. Charging through the gloom, two huge shapes came into view. Kirishima, along with Takao, Atago, and the destroyers, led by Iron Army, illuminated the lead ship and saw the USS South Dakota, a battleship armed with nine 16-inch guns. The Japanese reacted just as the Americans had reacted to Hiei last night. Oh, shit! As soon as the illumination came on, a barrage of five-inch fire smacked into Iron Army in the superstructure, setting her ablaze immediately. The Japanese returned fire, pummeling South Dakota with everything they had. But for some reason, the guns on South Dakota weren't firing. But they had just taken fire. Where did that fire come from? Something weird was going on. It turned out that the chief engineer aboard USS South Dakota had been troubleshooting an electrical fault, and as such, he had disabled the breakers. However, this had one problem. If a surge happened, it would start a series failure and trip the safety on the electrical system. Which it did. And as he had disabled the breakers, it ultimately meant that this would shut down power throughout the entire ship. Which it did. South Dakota was defenseless. Which then, again, begged the question, where the hell did that 5-inch fire come from? As Takao and Otago laid into the target, Kirishima was firing her secondaries while reloading her main battery. And in all of this chaos, they had forgotten. When they were approaching, there were two shapes moving on them. Not just one. Oh no. Oh yeah! At that precise moment, Admiral Ching Li, five times Olympic gold medalist in marksmanship and certified stone cold badass, ordered his ship, the battleship USS Washington, to open fire with a full broadside of all nine of his 16 inch guns at a distance of 9,000 yards. Kirishima did not stand a chance. With South Dakota sailors cheering them on, Washington blew the Congo class apart like it was nothing. The analysis of Kirishima's remains several decades later showed so many hits it more resembles a scrap heap coral reef than a shipwreck. With the loss of their battleship, the Japanese turned tail and withdrew, scuttling Iron Army as they went. Though US losses were heavy, it would turn out to be a resounding victory, with the knowledge that two full-sized US battleships were tearing towards them, the remainder of the convoy ships beached themselves in the Japanese held area of Guadalcanal in the hopes of offloading their gear. But as the sun rose, they found out that the Americans had been watching them the whole time. The marine artillerymen down the coast blanketed the area in 105 shells, while the Cactus Air Force launched wave after wave of aircraft at the poor bastards still trying to unload their gear. The coup de grace though came as the destroyer USS Meade arrived on scene and blasted the transports with a withering barrage of 5-inch, rendering them flaming funeral pyres for the campaign. They hadn't had time to get their equipment off the ships, and so 
All they had achieved was to deliver 2,000 men without food, weapons, or supplies to an already starving garrison. The arrival of Enterprise and her detached battleship escorts had quite literally decided the Battle of Guadalcanal. And once again, Enterprise had made history. She was the first to sink a fleet-class-sized vessel, the first to sink a full-sized fleet carrier, the first to sink multiple carriers in a single engagement, and now she had scored the US Navy's first kill on a battleship of World War II, and the first battleship sunk by the US Navy for over half a century. Enterprise just can't be stopped. In the Japanese camp, meanwhile, there was a sickening realization. Both the army commanders and Admiral Yamamoto knew. The Battle of Guadalcanal was lost. So the question was now how to get their troops out alive for use in future battles. At the rate things were going, they were losing 50 men a day due to starvation, malnutrition-induced disease, malaria, and all the issues an unsupplied army suffers from. But the situation was even worse than they feared. Submarines and long-range recon aircraft had spotted large American troop movements, bringing what seemed to be an entire division of troops to relieve the now exhausted Marines who had fought a campaign that would go down in history as a legend. Even worse still, US Navy reinforcements were inbound, which included, of course, USS Enterprise. They were against the clock and knew it. In December, Emperor Hirohito authorized a complete withdrawal of Japanese forces from Guadalcanal by February. Utilizing the Tokyo Express to make night runs to and from Rabaul to establish a new defensive line further up the Solomons. Problem is, of course, to get everyone out on time, they were going to need to make runs during the day as well. Which, as you recall, is a very bad idea. So they had to achieve air superiority of some kind, or at least air parity, to keep the Americans busy and off base enough to give them some breathing room. Operation K was its name. The objective simple. Throw enough air power at the Cactus Air Force and US Navy to keep them busy in order to get the troops away via the Tokyo Express. As always though, the Americans were listening, but for the first time in a long time, they completely misinterpreted the intelligence. Halsey and the gang read the Japanese build-up in the area as a sign of a renewed offensive, and thus threw everything they had into the region in order to draw the Japanese to a battle they could win. A troop convoy was dispatched in preparation for renewed landing, along with a reinforcing surface group full of cruisers and destroyers, augmented by escort carriers and supported by the Enterprise Task Force. The Japanese spotted the convoy escort force on the evening of January 29th, 1943, while intelligence sources reported the departure of the troop transports. Fearing that these were troops being brought to take advantage of their weakness instead of the defensive force they actually were, Rabaul scrambled their bombers to interdict them near Rennell Island at the entrance to the Solomons. As the sun began to go down, the combat air patrols covering the various task forces returned to their carriers. The Japanese bombers, however, being bombers, are all trained instrument flyers and pressed their attack at sunset. The Americans were taken completely by surprise, sailing in column, unprepared for what was about to hit them. 32 Mitsubishi bombers, 16 G3Ms and 16 G4Ms swooped in on a torpedo run as a Jake recon aircraft dropped flares to mark their approach. Flak began lighting up the darkening sky as the first wave of 16 bombers pushed in. The destroyers and cruisers scattered, evading the torpedoes that followed, while claiming one of the bombers which crashed in flames in the middle of their churning wakes. Believing this attack to be the only one though, the commander of the escorts, Admiral Griffin, ordered the force to regroup, which put the cruisers in a compromising position just in time for the second wave of bombers to strike. Coming in at wave top height, the G4Ms tracked in on one of the biggest ships they could see, the cruisers up front. The AA guns once again began blazing away, knocking down two of the bombers, including the flight lead, but this did not deter the Japanese as they released their torpedoes. One of the weapons slammed into USS Wichita, but luckily for the crew aboard it, it was a dud. For USS Chicago, however, 
There was no such reprieve. Two torpedoes slammed into her machinery spaces, bringing her to a dead stop almost immediately, while killing a number of the crew. During the chaos, the Japanese beat a hasty retreat, their job done for the evening. But rest assured, they'd be back tomorrow. Chicago was taken under tow as the Americans recovered their composure. Enterprise, as a result of this, was ordered to link up fully with the formation and integrate the Grim Reapers into their combat air patrol to cover them all the way to Guadalcanal. Throughout the next day, January 30th, Japanese recon aircraft circled the various American task forces, tracking their movements in preparation to launch strikes in the afternoon. But every time they had tried to get precise locations, Enterprise's fighters chased them away. Even so, bases on New Guinea scrambled bombers, and 11 G4M Bettys made their way towards the US ships. At 1540, Enterprise's radar picked up the formation, along with the lead scout aircraft, and scrambled its alert fighters. The Wildcats turned in towards the bombers, which appeared to be heading towards the carrier group. However, their true aims became apparent. The Bettys turned in on the wounded USS Chicago and her escorts, aiming to finish what their comrades from Rabaul had started, but this time the Grim Reapers were waiting. As the bombers lined up their attack run, the combat air patrol descended on them. There were no zeros to cover them, and as such the Americans committed fully to the attack. The lead scout of the formation was sent down in a ball of flame, while the alert force of 10 Wildcats dove in on the attackers through their own anti-aircraft screen. Two more bombers went down into the sea before they could deploy their torpedoes, but the attack run had been perfectly timed to evade the beat of the combat air patrol. However, it would cost them their lives. The remaining aircraft released their weapons, which began heading towards their targets. Having carried out their duty, all that remained was their fate, which the pilots of VF-10 helped them meet presently, tearing the unarmored Mitsubishis to shreds scattering their wreckage across the surface of the water, along with the men inside. But their mission was complete. A full volley of torpedoes slammed into USS Chicago, while an outlying torpedo heavily damaged USS Lavalette. The cruiser was doomed at that very moment. Her crew abandoned ship as the wounded destroyer limped away. The sinking of this ship took a whole squadron of bombers and their crews, but their psychological impact was far more important. Due to the increased air activity across the board, as well as this successful attack, American forces pulled back into the Coral Sea in preparation for what they suspected to be a new Japanese offensive, allowing the Japanese to successfully evacuate from Guadalcanal and bring their naval forces safely back into their air defense umbrella. By February, the first major American campaign in the Pacific was over. And while it wasn't a decisive victory, it was nevertheless an incredible one. And it would not have been possible without the brave men aboard the US Navy's finest lady, USS Enterprise. Now it was the time to turn to a new offensive north. The Japanese had to be fully pushed out of the Solomons and New Guinea. However, to the north, storm clouds were brewing. A typhoon of Nippon Steel was preparing to put to sea. Carrier Division 5 had re-equipped, and new carriers were entering service with combined fleet. The world's two largest warships were based in an anchorage akin to a fortress, staring down the world, daring all brave enough to do battle and island after island had airfields being constructed, defended by thousands of battle-hardened soldiers ready to die for their emperor rather than surrender. Enterprise, scarred by constant battles since the beginning of the war over a year ago, stood alone. Her hangar deck still bearing that sign, Enterprise versus Japan. It seemed that again, once more, she would stand as the free world's only protector in the Pacific. Hey, Enterprise! 
I've got it from here. I'm Essex, the first of many and full of fight. I'm intrepid, defending our legacy. Bunker Hill, never surrender, never sink. Ticonderoga, on the seas and in the sky. Shangri-La, strike from the heavens. Lexington 16, forging the future. Task Force 58! With the arrival of the Essex-class carriers, Enterprise finally got a chance to return for her refit. On the 27th of May 1943, she returned to Pearl Harbor where Nimitz honoured her with the first ever presidential unit citation awarded to an aircraft carrier in United States naval history. Her air group were detached and sent back to the mainland for special training, while Enterprise herself was sent to Puget Sound Naval Yard for refit up to modern standards. She needed extensive overhauls to repair all the battle damage she had suffered from her valiant service. It was so bad that Vestal and a crew of Seabees had been aboard her, keeping her afloat all the way back to Pearl Harbor. Improving her defenses was therefore obviously the biggest priority, if she was going to survive the ever-increasing lethality of the battle space. And so, when she docked in Puget Sound on the 20th of July 1943, a question was asked. How many guns do you want on this thing? To which the response was yes. The sheer amount of firepower added to the ship boggles the mind. As Drakinifel so often says, this was going to be American levels of anti-air defense. Eight 5-inch guns, 40 40mm Bofors guns, 50 20mm Orlikon cannons, and enough ammunition to fight a police action single-handedly. Upgrades were made to all of her internal systems and radar, while adding huge armored blisters under the waterline for added stability and greatly enhanced protection from the deadly Japanese torpedoes. But as the title of this chapter suggests, and the fact that her air wing was on a special training rotation, there was one really big change to Enterprise's role that once again made her a pioneer and a legend. CV-6 was to be the first ever knight-capable carrier, designation CVN. And given her successor, you know why that's so perfect. The Reapers and their strike colleagues, meanwhile, were to become the experts at the cutting edge of naval aviation. However, there was one more vital change before she was combat ready. A new coat of paint. And emblazoned on her decks were the symbols she would be known by for all time. All who flew over her would be graced with a giant but singular numeral. The number six. It was time for the Grey Ghost to get back in action. Enterprise pulled into Pearl Harbor on November 7th, 1943, for her new assignment. Her assignment was to provide the long-awaited night strike capability to the Fast Carrier Task Force, designated Task Force 58. And to give you an idea where we're at, this is a picture of what Task Force 58 looked like in 1944. Just look at it. Military industrial complex go. I got seven Mac 11s, about eight, 38, nine, nine, ten, Mac 10, the ships never end. Enterprise's first combat action after her refit was in support of retaking Macon Atoll by the 27th Infantry Division from November 19th to the 21st. The brand new F 6F Hellcats with their multi role capability proved to be outstanding at close air support. Unfortunately, though, the invasion was a bit of a fiasco. Japanese submarine I-175 managed to penetrate the ASW screen and sink the escort carrier USS Liscombe Bay with a direct hit to the ammunition storage hold, detonating the ship and killing 644 men. 
while the amphibious operation was a victim of bad intelligence, getting stuck on reefs and sandbars and not discovered during the initial invasion reconnaissance. Nevertheless, the Americans managed to take the island after defeating the 400-man garrison, but the price was a costly one. But Enterprise came into her own during the aftermath of this operation and proved her new capability. On the 26th of November, a wing of G4M Bettys launched a night attack on US Task Force 50.2, attached to the invasion force. Enterprise scrambled its fighter squadron on the alert status, VF-2. In command of VF-2 was the legendary Navy ace Butch O'Hare. The fighters were vectored onto the oncoming Japanese formation, and spotting them against the dark indigo sky, commenced their attack. Several bombers went down in flames, while the remainder unloaded their defensive guns at the black shapes in the gloom. The Japanese were taken completely unawares. They had heard no reports or even thought it possible that they would face naval night fighters. In an uncharacteristic panic, they ditched their bombs and ran for home. Their job done, the Americans returned to base only to find themselves one man missing. And it was the unthinkable. The man who failed to return was Butch O'Hare. It's assumed he took critical damage or was killed outright by return fire from the bombers, as no shoot was seen or radio call made. He simply vanished and was never found. But war does not leave time to mourn, and Enterprise was the only night-capable strike weapon the US Navy had available, and they needed her for a mission which a year ago would have been near suicidal. So, you remember that massive fortress garrisoned by the two biggest battleships ever built, surrounded by hundreds of AA guns, five airfields full of Zeros, and enough soldiers to successfully police Chicago? Yeah. Truck Lagoon, Japan's fleet base in the South Pacific and target number one for US air power in the region. But now Enterprise had night capability. And moreover, she had an entire battle group of younger sisters in the Essex class, eager to lay waste to their enemies. And so a plan was drawn up by Nimitz to finally neutralize Truck Lagoon. The operation was titled Operation Hailstone. On February 17, 1944, Enterprise Essex Intrepid Bunker Hill and Yorktown II, along with their escort carriers, moved into position. Between them, they had 500 planes and a plan. In the early morning darkness, the first wave of fighters launched, followed by the TBF Avengers, led by Enterprise's bomb group. After getting airborne and forming up, the entire strike force dropped to wave top height, flying at under 100 feet all the way to the target. Japanese radar was not as sophisticated as the sets used in Europe or the United States, and as such, they had no raid warning until lookouts sighted the raid approaching the target. The Grim Reapers upon this moment punched their engines and gained height above the bombers, while the Avengers moved in on the Japanese airfields. The Zeros on alert tried to get airborne, but only the aircraft on immediate standby managed to get up. Of the 300 Japanese aircraft based at Truck, only 80 managed to launch. The rest were incinerated by Enterprise and Intrepid's Avenger pilots, who blanketed the airfields in cluster munitions and incendiary bombs. As the Zeros turned to engage the bombers that had hit their airfield, they were set upon by the Grim Reapers, along with their colleagues from the other four carriers. The new Hellcats had huge engines, 650 cal machine guns, and pilots with hundreds of hours on type in training. The older A6M2s and A6M3s were already too slow to keep up with them, and even in the most favourable conditions they would have had a hard time beating them. In this situation, just after takeoff, no altitude, no speed, no warning, no chance. The Americans hit them again and again throughout the day, with almost the entire air garrison of truck being wiped out with the loss of only four Hellcats. The Americans had achieved air superiority over the target, and now they intended to use it. The airfields, having been suppressed, were finished off in the second wave, leaving the lagoon completely helpless against the systematic dismemberment that was about to take place. Luckily for the Japanese, they had recognized the vulnerability of Truck since the loss of Guadalcanal and the Solomons, which led them to withdraw Yamato and Musashi to their anchorage in the home islands. But the unfortunate fact was that this base had the majority of their infrastructure in their outer defense perimeter. And as a result, a large contingent of their transport shipping still transited through Truck regularly. 
The Americans launched multiple raids throughout the day, sinking over 200,000 tons of shipping. Two cruisers, four destroyers, three auxiliary cruisers, six auxiliary support vessels of various types and purpose, and 32 merchants. This was on top of over 250 aircraft, all of the base infrastructure, and 4,500 personnel. But the most impressive fact of all of this? Well, due to their ability to operate at night, the later strikes were exclusively conducted by Enterprise, representing the first radar-guided night attack by carrier-launched aircraft. The pilots of USS Enterprise would claim a third of all the ships sunk during Operation Hailstone, while the Reapers took a similarly hefty toll on the Zeros. The highest individual score across both categories among all of the carriers present. The next few weeks would prove frantically busy for Enterprise as she, along with her fellow carriers, sailed through the Caroline Islands as part of Operation Cartwheel, the ongoing campaign to encircle Rabaul and finish the Solomon Islands campaign once and for all. She launched strikes on Peleliu, Yap, Ulithi and Woliai before sailing to support amphibious landings in New Guinea. It was a busy couple of months, but she executed her duties with the same lethal efficiency she always displayed. And it was then she was ordered back to the forward replenishment base on Majuro Island in the Marshalls to stand by for an upcoming offensive. Task Force 58 was to be the primary striking force in support of a campaign to take the Marianas Islands and to liberate Guam. And at the core of this operation was the island of Saipan and its airfields. Taking this island would give the Americans a base from which they could operate a brand new aircraft they were developing to strike the Japanese home islands. And there were quiet rumors in the upper levels of the Pentagon that it was also intended to carry a secret weapon. The Japanese, likewise, were committed. This was sovereign Japanese territory. Their territory. Allowing the enemy to take it would be a dishonor to both the army and navy, and it was one they could not accept, especially the navy, who after their Pyrrhic victory at Santa Cruz had failed to halt the oncoming American threat, and allowed their commander-in-chief, Admiral Yamamoto, to be assassinated by the enemy. They had to be stopped here. Combined fleet had a new armored fleet carrier, the Taiho. They had Yamato and Musashi. They had Kongo and Haruna. But most vital of all, they had Carrier Division 5, Shokaku and Zuikaku, who were both freshly equipped with new air groups. And that was just the capital ships. The light carrier force of the Imperial Japanese Navy was still very much in play, but the fact was the Japanese pilot losses had been horrific, and unlike the Allies, their reserves of trained manpower was much lower than the required number of replacements. The naval aviators of Combined Fleet were a shadow of their predecessors, but that was of little concern. The Kantai Kessen, the decisive battle, was once again upon them. This was their last chance to blunt the American offensive. If the Americans took Saipan, they could strike the homeland, their emperor. They must be stopped here. They must go this far and no further. Combined fleet under Admiral Ozawa put to sea. This would be the decider of his country's fate. History would come to know the upcoming showdown as the Battle of the Philippine Sea. But that's not its true name. The name of that battle was granted to it by the aviators of USS Lexington, CV-16, and it has been passed down through the generations to this very day as the tale of how the Japanese Naval Air Service died. This battle is known by this name. They'll come loud and they'll come fast. We shoot first and we can last. Keep your rifle by your side. Sing in. USS Enterprise, alongside the other ships of Task Force 58, ran an extensive air campaign throughout the Marianas, striking Guam, Saipan, and Rota amongst other targets. The Japanese had not expected a push this far north so soon. Rather, they were certain a campaign to secure the rest of the Southern Pacific, or perhaps an offensive launched into Indonesia to threaten their oil supplies. This is what led them to realize that their goal was air bases to attack the home islands. 
The problem was, while Saipan and Guam were veritable fortresses, guarded with the largest concentration of Japanese armoured units outside of China and Kyushu, as well as tens of thousands of men in well-entrenched positions, their air power was diffused amongst all their other installations, to guard Truk, which as we saw didn't go as planned, as well as other major islands such as Rabaul and Peleliu, meaning they only had a force of around 50 land-based aircraft in the Marianas as a whole. This is what led to the aforementioned mass deployment of what amounted to the entire Japanese Navy. It was the only way to get enough assets in theatre to have a hope of achieving victory. If they could disrupt the landing forces and drive off Task Force 58, Yamato and Musashi could get amongst the transports and massacre the landing force in a counterattack. The odds were long. Like, really, really long. But it was all or nothing at this point. By contrast, the Americans had, as the youth of today say, aircraft for literal days. They outnumbered the Japanese two to one in aircraft, and what's even crazier is that the quality of those planes and their pilots was far superior. The Japanese, due to their industrial and technological limitations, had not been able to field new aircraft capable of meeting the American threat, at least not with their naval aviation designs. The newer Judy naval bomber was a step in the right direction, as were the later models of A6M5, but there simply weren't enough of them. The army was having better luck with the Ki-61 and the Ki-84 designs, and there was some hope in the horizon for the navy. The N1K Shiden Kai was one of the best fighters of World War II, and it had started service, at least in limited numbers, in 1943. But they, as I mentioned, were even rarer than the other designs, and worst of all, despite being a naval fighter, they were not carrier capable. And so, this battle would be fought once again, with Zeros, Vals, and Kates, versus Hellcats, Avengers, Corsairs, and Helldivers, although some FM2 Wildcats and SPDs were still present at this battle. As dawn of June 15th, 1944 swept the horizon, Amtraks began rolling off LSTs, forming a gagglefuck the likes of which mankind hadn't yet seen. Thousands upon thousands of malicious beings, fueled by nicotine, crayons, and hatred, slowly made their way towards the beaches. No longer were they the under-resourced and undermanned shambles that held the line two years prior against all odds. No, these were well-equipped, heavily armed, lean, mean marines. And in the words of Union Cavalry Commander John Buford at the Battle of Gettysburg, there would be a devil to pay. The Japanese were waiting for them. As the Amtraks approached the coral and shallows, the crews noticed odd flags fixed at various intervals, and then they realized with horror that the Japanese had planned way farther ahead than they thought. Range markers. Artillery began hitting the landing craft with deadly precision, killing hundreds of men before they even got to the beaches. The ones that did make it were very soon cut down by overlapping fields of fire from machine guns. Over a thousand men fell battling through those defences. But as they struggled through, the pillboxes and gun positions were systematically obliterated by airstrikes delivered by none other than USS Enterprise and her colleagues. By nightfall, the Americans had managed to establish a beachhead which they held against a brutal counterattack, one of the most incredibly tense battles of the entire Pacific War, inflicting devastating losses on the Japanese, wiping out much of their remaining armor in the process. The commander of naval infantry and what little air power on Saipan there was, one Admiral Chuichi Nagamo, yep, he's back advised Vice Admiral Ozawa of the situation. And so the fateful decision was made. The Kantai Kesen. The decisive battle would be fought here, and the entirety of Combined Fleet sailed to meet the invaders. Meanwhile, Nimitz, who was coordinating with Admiral Spruance, had been reading reports on large Japanese fleet movements while keeping up to date with the landings on Saipan. It was then he got an urgent signal from USS Flying Fish, a Gatto-class submarine conducting recon as an advanced picket. They had spotted what to them looked like the entire Japanese navy sailing straight towards the Marianas. 
This was likewise met with reports from other submarines that detected smaller groups of surface ships, including battleships, coming from all axes of advance still under Japanese control. Both Spruance and Nimitz agreed that this had to be the all-or-nothing play they suspected would come sooner or later, and that every Japanese ship still afloat was coming to the party. This was followed by a signal intercepted from a lone communications vessel. Admiral Ozawa was sending word ahead to Guam that he wanted to use the airfield to forward stage his aircraft after their initial strikes. At this news, the Task Force 58 commander, Admiral Mitcher, wanted to sail his forces into an attack position, ready to strike first. But Spruance instead saw this as an opportunity. Instead of meeting the attack, let's play their game and set a trap. Frag orders went out to the fighter squadrons across the fleet. Combat air patrols would go up at dawn, while an entire wing of Hellcats would be ordered to conduct a defensive combat air patrol and fighter sweep over Guam, Rota, and the surrounding islands. If the Japanese wanted to come have a go, the Americans would be more than happy to oblige them. After all, they had radar, superior aircraft, an integrated air defense network, and the new anti-aircraft refits completed across all vessels, which came with proximity-fused ammunition. Any frontal assault by aircraft against them without adequate numbers of experienced pilots in good planes would be flat-out suicidal. Unfortunately, the Japanese would later prove they had no hesitation in that regard. On the 19th of June, 1944, the morning was filled with activity on both sides. Aircraft from Guam began taking off in search of the American fleet, while Enterprise and her pilots began prepping to launch. At 5.50 a.m., a single zero on his search patrol found Task Force 58 sailing into the wind to launch aircraft and immediately radioed the fleet's position. This done, he dived in on one of the destroyer pickets to deposit his bomb that he had on board. It was then that this poor Japanese aviator discovered the advances the Americans had made in their anti-aircraft defense when he was immediately obliterated by concentrated fire. Realizing that they had now been spotted, USS Bella Wood expedited its launch procedures and scrambled its entire contingent of Hellcats to cover the combat air patrol mission over Guam. They had arrived just as the main strike group of Zeros were taking off, just as had happened at Truck several months before. The poor Japanese pilots had absolutely no hope of survival, and in the ensuing dogfight, 35 aircraft were shot down to the loss of one Hellcat. They then set about strafing the airfield and suppressing the defenders when an alarm call came through their headsets. Hey Rube! Hey Rube! Hey Rube! The emergency recall message. Task Force 58's air defense radar pickets had picked up a large formation of Japanese aircraft, several of them in fact, incoming to strike the American carrier force. Immediately all US aircraft were launched. The fighters formed up into their squadrons to be vectored for intercept, while the bombers moved to staging areas away from the main battle area for safety. Spruance wanted the carriers to be empty should they take any hits in order to preserve his force as much as possible. At that point, a raid count was reported to the commander of air operations. 68 bandits in total were out there in the first wave, but for some reason, they were scattered in smaller groups. The Japanese had not formed up after launch, Rather, they had decided to stage immediately prior to launching the attack outside of the area of Task Force 58's control. While this is optimal both in attack coordination and fuel economy, it doesn't factor in the reality that the Americans would have seen them on radar. In the time it took for the Japanese attack to get organized, Task Force 58's fighters were vectored onto them. The Hellcats from Enterprise and Lexington reached the Japanese first. The Grim Reapers once again proved that their name was well earned, tearing into a formation of Zeros, while Lexington's pilots went after the bomber formation behind them. Lieutenant Alexander Vreshu from VF-16 lined up on the formation of newer duty bombers and engaged. The pilots were either very well disciplined or brand new, most likely the latter, as they didn't maneuver or change formation in an effort to foil his attack. They maintained their speed and heading. In just under eight minutes, Alex Vreshu had shot down six of the bombers before breaking off his attack. He wouldn't get a chance to go in for another run, however, as the remainder of the Hellcats from the other carriers joined the fray. 25 Japanese planes had been shot down in that initial engagement with Enterprise and Lex, 
but the ordeal wasn't over. At the hands of Essex, Bunker Hill, and half a dozen other fighter groups, another 17 were blasted out of the sky, leaving only 27 aircraft left to conduct an attack. Realizing that getting through to the carriers would be nearly impossible, they decided to attack the battleships and destroyers, providing the anti-aircraft screen, in the hopes that they could soften them up enough to give their comrades in the second and third waves a chance. The Hellcats broke off, leaving the anti-air gunners a clear field of fire, which they used to great effect. As a wall of lead flew into the sky, even more Japanese aircraft went up in flames or broke apart. From a raid of 68 aircraft, they were now down to six planes. Spotting USS South Dakota, they rolled in for an attack, but due to the weight of fire and the inexperience of the crews, only one bomb made contact, killing 50 men but otherwise doing no serious damage. However, the price they paid for that one hit did not equate in the slightest, and their day was only going to get a lot worse. As that doomed first wave of aircraft was disappearing over the horizon from their carriers, the second wave began launch operations on the now empty flight decks. Taiho, the flagship with Admiral Ozawa on board, was leading the second wave with her air group, and as such she was into the wind, sailing straight and true. One after another, a total of 42 aircraft lifted from her decks, quickly followed by aircraft from Shokaku and Suikaku. They were completely unaware that the submarine USS Albacore had been stalking the formation for the past two hours and had gotten inside their ASW screen. Failures in her targeting computer meant they had to aim by sight, but they had gotten close enough that it really didn't matter. A full spread of six torpedoes began their run against Taiho. Four of the torpedoes were wide, leaving only two to do the job. One of the last aircraft that had launched from Taiho, however, spotted the launch, and in an act of incredible bravery, dove his aircraft into the path of one of the torpedoes. But ultimately, one weapon made it through. And of all the places to hit, it hit the one place on a Japanese carrier that will kill it. USS Albacore's last torpedo smashed into the Taiho's hull directly underneath the aviation fuel tanks. While this on the surface did not seem fatal, as it had done with the carriers of Kido Butai, the enclosed hangar decks, and the excessive number of watertight bulkheads all the way up to Taiho's armoured flight deck, meant that fuel leaks and gasoline vapour spread flammable material all throughout the ship. So you now have a bunch of enclosed spaces filled with a fuel air mixture, which is on a ship that is operating both weapons and performing aircraft maintenance. And that maintenance is performed with things like welding torches and generators. Taiho exploded, completely destroying the ship along the length of the flight deck killing 1,650 men. Admiral Ozawa, being on the bridge, survived, and so along with his staff, he immediately transferred his flag to Zuikaku in order to keep track of the battle. Though I have a feeling at this point he probably wished that the explosion had incinerated him, as the news he was receiving was nothing short of disastrous. As the drama at the Japanese fleet played out, the Americans were in complete control of the situation, though it was a tense one. The second wave that Taiho had initiated was now reaching their radar picket line, a raid count of 107 aircraft. This time, though, the Hellcats were airborne and intercepted them head-on, 60 miles away from the task force. 50 Cal Tracer arced through the sky, drawing lines of death as the naval aviators smelled blood. The enemy was in their sights and at their mercy. However, no mercy would be shown. Of the 107 aircraft in Wave 2, 70 were shot down before they even saw the US carrier group. The remaining 30, knowing their fate was sealed, disregarded reason or sanity and dove headlong through the defensive AA screen at the nearest carrier they could find. The ship they found was USS Enterprise. But if you think she was going to stand for this, you are gravely mistaken. The Grey Ghost made highly erratic evasive turns. Her hangar bays being empty meant she almost took flight herself. One torpedo exploded in her wake and no hits were scored. Her gunners, meanwhile, did not miss their mark, sending several of the attackers down in flames. The remaining Japanese aircraft tried to hit the USS Princeton, but were gunned down by AA fire before they could even get close. 
107 Japanese aircraft attacked Task Force 58 in Wave 2. Only 10 made it back. The damage they had inflicted was nil. As the first flights of Hellcats landed, Alex Vreshu hopped out of his cockpit aboard Task Force 58's flagship, the Lady Lex, and he was received with a hero's welcome. He saw Admiral Mitchell looking down on him from the bridge catwalk. He grinned and held up six fingers. At that moment, a correspondent asked him to hold the gesture and snapped this iconic photograph. An image which became the symbol of the battle, as well as giving the battle its name. As while Lexington's pilots reported their incredible scores, one of them was heard to say, Hell, it's like an old-time turkey shoot. Meanwhile, back at the Japanese fleet, another US submarine was stalking closer to its prey. While USS Albacore had made its attack and drawn the destroyer screen towards them, USS Kavala had used the chaos to close in on the biggest target in the formation. Shokaku was just finishing up her evolutions from recovering the survivors of the attack against Task Force 58 and was now in the process of rearming and refueling them. At that moment, a full spread of torpedoes slammed into her starboard side. Once again, the enclosed hangar decks proved fatal, as the torpedo which hit the bow shattered the aviation fuel tanks while cooking off the aircraft being rearmed. This started a chain reaction along the ship, eventually hitting the munition storage, which went up like a fireball that rapidly began burning out of control. Eventually, after a few minutes, the vapor from the ruptured fuel lines reached critical temperature and ignited. Shokaku exploded, killing 1,253 men. Two of the three fleet carriers the battle began with had been lost. All that remained was Zuikaku and an assortment of light carriers. But a carrier without an air group is just a boat, and by the end of the day, their air groups would be gone. The third attack wave of Japanese aircraft was intercepted further out from the American task force than the others by a wing of 40 Hellcats. The Japanese lost seven planes in the initial pass, and upon realizing they could not get near the enemy task force before losses became critical, they wisely chose to abort their mission, meaning that they would survive to return to what was left of Kido Butai. The fourth wave, though, would not be so lucky. The fourth wave had been given an incorrect heading to the American task force and got lost. Being split up and disorganized, they decided to return to the base on Guam. As they did so though, a contingent of 18 aircraft once again stumbled across none other than USS Enterprise. However, her combat air patrol was up and the Grim Reapers spotted them first. They would go on to shoot down nine of them before they could even start their attack. The surviving nine aircraft Realizing that that was a bad idea, switched their focus to Wasp and Bunker Hill, but scored no hits. Only one of the 18 attackers managed to escape, but the American fighter pilots weren't done. They realized the amount of damage they had done to the first two waves, and thus detailed several flights of Hellcats to sweep Guam's airfields in case any stragglers diverted to land there instead of the carriers. And they did this without realizing that the fourth wave had aborted there. And so as the remaining 49 Japanese aircraft entered the landing pattern, the Americans jumped them. 30 of the Japanese planes were shot down, while the other 19 were so heavily damaged they were written off on landing. Throughout the rest of the day, roving fighter sweeps caught stragglers and cleared the way for search and rescue efforts for what few US pilots were shot down. As the 19th of June 1944 ended, the Americans had lost 30 aircraft and suffered light damage to one ship, and the pilots of those aircraft were mostly recovered. The Japanese, by contrast, had lost two fleet carriers, over 350 aircraft, and thousands of men. And the worst part of all for them was, as night fell, Task Force 58 moved into attack position. The battle wasn't over. But amazingly enough, it was then that the Japanese themselves finally had a stroke of luck. After the devastating losses they had suffered, Admiral Ozawa decided to reposition his carriers west and launch attacks from his air groups that he assumed were safely on the ground at Guam. 
he had no idea that they had already been destroyed. This meant that when the Americans went looking for where the Japanese had been, they were long gone. Almost the whole day went by when a scout from USS Enterprise finally found Kido Batai. The problem was they were approaching the limit of strike range, and given it was 14.30 or 2.30pm when the report came in, that gave the Americans only one chance to hit the Japanese before operations would have to be concluded. Mitchell ordered a full-scale attack with multiple waves to launch in sequence. The first wave of 226 aircraft, 95 Hellcats, 54 Avengers, 51 Helldivers and 26 Dauntlesses, took off, formed up and headed to the target. It was then that a frantic message came through from Enterprise's scout. Their range calculation had been incorrect. The Japanese were actually 60 miles further away than they thought. Mitcher immediately cancelled the subsequent waves of aircraft, but not wanting to lose this opportunity to counterattack, he ordered the first wave to continue on mission. Zuikaku's combat air patrol, 35-0 strong, was orbiting Kido Butai and getting ready to organize recovery for the night. As the sun began to set, however, they noted a large black cloud swarming towards them. Over 200 American aircraft from Task Force 58 intent on delivering the final knockout blow to the Japanese Navy. Stopping them was not going to happen. As such, the only thing they could do was dive in and try to take down as many of the enemy as they could. But with 95 Hellcats between them and the bombers, it was never really going to pose a true threat. The combat air patrol was swept aside as though they weren't there, clearing the way for the Avengers and dive bombers to hit their targets. Enterprise's air group was in one of the leading elements. Seeing the other flights breaking off to hit different targets, VB and VT-10 split off between the ships. The Avengers zoned in on Ryuho, dropping their bombs. However, they only inflicted minor shock damage with near misses from their main bomb load. The dive bombers, however, had better luck. They had chosen the biggest target and the current flagship, Zuikaku. Near misses caused shock damage to her hull as well, but one bomb managed to hit the flight deck and detonated in the hangar bay, starting fires. But fully aware to the danger and light on aircraft, she did not suffer the same fate as her sisters. Her neighbouring carrier Hiyo did not. A flight of Avengers from USS Bellawood slammed her with torpedoes and bombs. Like the other carriers before, the same fatal flaw doomed the ship. A fuel air explosion detonated the hull, setting her ablaze, rendering her dead in the water, ultimately leading her to sink stern first. The Japanese ships had began to evade and scatter, managing to avoid serious damage other than superficial hits. But with the loss of Hiyo, Taiho and Shokaku, along with the entirety of the fleet's aircraft, the battle was now done, and no one could deny the scale of the Americans' victory. They had destroyed the entire Imperial Japanese Naval Air Service for less than 40 aircraft and minor damage to South Dakota. But in a twist of fate, the Americans would end up balancing the score themselves. Due to the miscalculation of range when the attack was launched, it became clear to the aviators and the flag officers of Task Force 58 that a large number of the strike package would not be able to return to the fleet and be forced to ditch. Worse still, they had attacked at sunset, meaning those landings would be night landings, something only the Enterprise aviators were really trained to do. At 2045, the first American aircraft began arriving, running on literal fumes. Knowing that their pilots wouldn't be able to see, they made a risky but necessary tactical decision. All of a sudden, the lights of Task Force 58 flashed on. All the carriers lit up like Christmas trees, while all the surface warships began firing star shells to bring the raiders back home. A radio call went out for all returning aircraft that restrictions on landing protocols were completely lifted. If you can find a carrier, just land on it. We'll sort out who belongs where tomorrow. This led to a tense situation where two aircraft tried landing on Enterprise simultaneously, but miraculously they avoided crashing and were successfully recovered. Aircraft from all over the fleet ended up on every single open flight deck, to the extent that half of Enterprise's landings were from other carriers. 
while her flight group ended up scattered across all throughout the carriers and the fleet. This organized chaos took place all over Task Force 58 in one giant scramble to get aboard. But despite these frankly Herculean efforts, 80 aircraft still ended up ditching, with three quarters of the crews being rescued. Sadly, however, some aircraft crashed on landing due to running out of fuel, while others went down unseen by air sea rescue costing the aviators aboard them their lives. It was an unceremonious and tragic end to what had been a miraculously decisive victory. They had accomplished their mission. The marines on Saipan were safe from the naval and air threat, and Kido Batai, it seemed, had been vanquished once and for all. But not completely. Suikaku, her air wing decimated, and her sister dead, limped home with her wounded comrades throughout the night. The outcome of the war was now no longer in doubt. It was over. At one time, she and her sister sailed alongside the mightiest naval force the world had ever seen, and now... And now that seemed like a distant memory. A hollow and pathetic joke in the face of the raw power that she had just witnessed. They couldn't stand against this. They had no help coming. There was no reinforcements, no saving grace. There was nothing. The Americans would take Saipan. Her old commander would die her countrymen, the men which she pledged to protect, they would all die. And the enemy would be in range of her homeland. Suikaku was alone. There was no help coming. Of the original carriers of Kido Butai, which struck fear into the enemy, she was the very last one left. She was alone. Her country, her family, her home, all of them would burn. And there was absolutely nothing that she could do to stop it. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. Substantial portions of Japan's key industrial centers have been leveled to the ground in a series of record incendiary raids. What has already happened to Tokyo will happen to every Japanese city if the Japanese insist on continuing resistance beyond the point of reason our blows will destroy their whole modern industrial plant and organization which they have built up during the past century and which they are now devoting to a hopeless cause. Only surrender can prevent the kind of ruin as a result of continued useless resistance.